All right, so um, spoiler alert, everything I'm about to say is true. <laughs> because to quote Catherine Behar, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> In 2012, NASA's two Voyager probes left the solar system and entered interstellar space. It will be 40,000 years before they make a close approach to another planetary system. Each spacecraft contains a phonograph record of sounds and images selected in 1977 to portray the diversity of life and culture on Earth to an alien intelligence or to future humans. As Carl Sagan, the curator of the Voyager Golden Records content, meticulously explains, quote, Instructions for playing the record, written in scientific language, are etched on the cover. A cartridge and stylus, illustrated on the cover, are tucked into the spacecraft nearby. The record is ready to play." End of quote. Besides humans, the other animal prominently featured on the record is the humpback whale. <laughs> whale songs are included as part of the human and whale greetings section, in which hello appears in 60 human languages spoken by UN delegates, as well as one whale language, humpback. <laughs> quote, this is Sagan again. So as to leave no hint of provincialism in the greetings from the UN delegations, we mixed these characteristically human greetings with the characteristic hellos of the humpback whale. <laughs> Another intelligent species from the planet Earth sending greetings to the stars. Whales fill a, a completely different function than birds, which are part of the Sounds of Earth track, or Chuck Berry, who appears on the music track. They are included as speakers, somewhere in between humans and the alien intelligences we imagined must be out there. Whalians, if you will. Utopian thinkers have known since at least the 18th century that changing the world required profound shifts in relationships between humans and other animals. 19th century socialist utopian Charles Fourier took the treatment of animals in his times as a symptom of profound social failure. Wikipedia credits Fourier with inventing the term feminism, and upon closer inspection, he turns out to have been not only the original feminist, but the original queer interspecies feminist thinker of labor, for whom labor is at bottom never merely human and fundamentally inseparable from desire or what he calls attraction, which makes him also probably the original affect theorist. <laughs> only organization based on the laws of attraction can be successful, says Fourier and result in interspecies peace. And peace among humans was indistinguishable from peace in the natural world at large. So Fourier writes about a future in which the oceans will, be, um, will become lemonade, like once things really work out, right? It's, uh, it's the, the planet will be sort of so at peace with itself that, um, that the oceans will be pink uh, lemonade. The former could not happen without a major shift in relations with other animals and with capital N nature. But for Fourier, such a shift was possible only if we all leaned in a bit closer. His favorite example of this invo involved the cochineal. Cochineal? Does anyone know how to pronounce this? Cochineal. 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 <coughs> a tiny beetle from whose body the dye carmine is extracted. The female cochineal produces carminic acid to deter predators. Dried beetle carcasses are ground to a fine dark red powder which is then mixed with different mineral salts like aluminum and calcium, as well as different citrus juices to produce over 25 different renewable, non-toxic shades of red, from oranges and crimsons to fuchsias and profound violets. Fourier loved the cochineal, not only because it brought color to the world, but because of its usefulness to us, which to him indicated pre-existing attraction. Red, of course, is not just any color, Rural Peruvian women have used cochineal for millennia, not only to dye their beautiful yarns, but as a long-lasting, kiss-proof lip stain. And carmine dye is still a common ingredient in lipsticks. Few things would have been more perfect in Fourier's imagination than the world that reveals itself in the kiss, when between mouths there is a thin layer of bright red lip stain dyed with acid extracted from the ground-up bodies of tiny beetles. <laughs> the golden record once again situates the kiss at the center of the utopian problem space. Andrew Ian was the project's creative director and later became Carl Sagan's third wife. The record includes an hour-long recording of her brainwaves 
about which Wikipedia reports, quote, during the recording of the brainwaves, Druyan thought of many topics, including <laughs> Earth's history, civilizations and the problems they face, and what it was like to fall in love. <laughs> Druyan also curated, uh, personally curated, the Sounds of Earth section in which she tried to show the whole of human experience in oral terms. During this process, she found herself surprised at how difficult it was to record the human kiss. Of the long catalog of sounds the group amassed, she writes, quote, this wonderful sound proved to be the most difficult to record. After numerous attempts, <clears throat> they still had nothing, the group still had nothing worthy of sending into space. <laughs> but, I, all true. But the reasons for this seem to have little to do with the sonorous qualities of kissing and more to do with the social imaginary the kiss produces. And here's Druyan, quote, this was to be that impossible thing, a kiss that would last forever. And we wanted it to be real, end of quote. Druyan's almost mournful description suggests that perhaps the only desire greater than the, than the desire to kiss is the desire that it be real. I'm going to say as an aside um, that uh, there were two women in the group, right? Druyan was one of them. Linda Saltzman Sagan, Sagan's wife at the time, <laughs> was the other woman in the group. They had strict orders, uh, Druyan writes, that they had strict orders from NASA to keep this kiss heterosexual. <laughs> but I like to imagine some alternate reality in which they didn't uh, follow these orders. And the two women in the group sort of, you know, looked at each other from across the room and, uh, and, and that there would have been sent into space, none of this happened, of course, but that there would have been sent into space a kiss that bypassed Carl Sagan altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but what about those whales? Do they have the same need? Cetaceans, so um, whales and dolphins, right? Cetaceans don't kiss. They don't even have lips. But they are the only other animal besides humans that mates belly to belly or face to face. Now, before you remind me that humans also mate in other positions, a fact of which I am aware I've seen the diagrams, <laughs> I'd like to simply return us to the other interesting fact that humans are unique among primates for mating belly to belly on a regular basis. Chips have been seen to do it, but only when they want to get super freaky. <laughs> Lacan once announced that there is no sexual rapport, but boy, do we keep looking for it. But so do whales and dolphins, it seems. As all the other animals simply fuck, maybe cetaceans suffer like we do <laughs> from the impossibility of sexual rapport, right? Might the fact of their face-to-face -face sex serve as evidence that they also long for the kiss to be real? As of today, we still don't know why humpbacks sing. Because it is only males who emit the most evocative songs, it was long taken for granted that this was a mating call. Um, after years of research, scientists have begun to question this since no female has ever been seen approaching a singing male. <laughs> a word of caution to you singing males out there. <laughs> And new findings suggest that females might vocalize also. Um, but back in 70 Sagan, uh, 77, <laughs> Sagan, yeah, the sort of thing you guys would do. Back in 77, right, Sagan paid tribute to the idea that humpback songs are mating calls by describing the whole of the golden record as itself a mating call, right? Quote, it is as much as the sounds of any baleen whale, a love song cast upon the vastness of the deep. If it makes sense to call the golden record a love song, this is due in large part to the work of Sagan's acquaintance, John C. Lilly. Psychoanalyst, neuroscientist, and enfant terrible of dolphin communication experiments in the 1960s. Enthusiast of isolation tanks, extraterrestrial life, and psychedelic drugs, often in combination, Lilly employed controversial techniques, including experiments in which he administered LSD to both himself and dolphins. And while Lilly was not directly involved with the Golden Record, one of its producers, astrophysicist, uh, astrophysicist Frank Drake, attended the now-famous 1961 Conference 
on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, at Green Bank, and reports that Lilly's dolphin work was at the center of how the goals and parameters of SETI were articulated, including, quote, the equations that remain basic to the SETI problem. In fact, the secret name of the group of scientists who created the golden record years later, including Sagan himself, was the Order of the Dolphin. Large parts of Lilly's writings are dedicated to explicating the changes in attitudes on the part of humans that alien or dolphin communication requires. All the beings involved, but especially the humans, would have to be, quote, dedicated, courageous, open-minded, and knowledgeable, observant and quick, as well as kindly, and first and foremost, wildly, unprecedentedly imaginative. It's no wonder Lilly responded with such enthusiasm when his young assistant, Margaret Lovat, suggested a live-in experiment with a dolphin named Peter. In 1965, the two lived together for two and a half months in a beautiful, sprawling, home-turned dolphinarium, which had been adapted into a laboratory of sorts and flooded with knee-deep water throughout. Under the more general goal of two-way communication, the point of Dolphin House was to try something that had never been tried before. The project was funded by NASA, and the center's director was none other than Gregory Bateson. Now these days, no one remembers or cares much about the communication experiments themselves. Readers both then and now are much more interested in Lovat's admission that she routinely masturbated Peter to orgasm because there were no female dolphins for him to mate with. Um, and I'll say, uh, I'll add also, I'm, I'm writing a, a, a book about a whale song in which I'm doing all this research on um, Lily. And when I tell people that I'm writing about dolphins, the only thing that people want to talk about is, do, they say things to me like, what about that woman that jerked off that dolphin? <laughs> this is literally the only thing that people remember or are interested in talking about. <clears throat> Although Lovat herself thought of the act as necessary to the research, right, and just another part of getting to know Peter, it became a focal point for critics of John Lilly. In the late 70s, Hustler published a story about Lovat, without her knowledge, called Interspecies Sex, Humans and Dolphins, as if the point of the experiment had been to study sexual relationships, relations between species. That, plus Lilly's interest in LSD, topped off by the eyebrow-raising SETI, reduced the entire Lily enterprise to an uncomfortable story of science gone wild. And interesting research program, uh, an interesting research program fallen prey to 60s permissiveness. In interviews, Lobat insists that the genital contact with Peter was not a sex act on her part. A recent article in The Guardian calls it innocent. And in Lovat's lab notes from, the from 1965, she seems just as uninterested in the event as she is in that Guardian interview. But the notes, her notes, also describe another activity. Dum -dum. A game. Sorry? I said dum -dum -dum. <laughs> <laughs> A game. Exactly. A game that she and Peter invented that consisted of him running his open mouth and thus his teeth gently up and down the length of her bare legs by which he had always been fascinated. Quote, this is Lovat. When we had nothing to do was when we did the most. He was very, very interested in my anatomy. If I was sitting here and my legs were in the water, he would come up and look at the back of my knee for a long time. He wanted to know how that thing worked. And I was so charmed by it. End of quote. That the part of her in question was her legs indicates how well Peter understood the significant differences between them. <laughs> Almost like some tragic merman, right? And he did commit suicide after their separation, right? In the way that dolphins are now known to, to commit suicide by um, shutting off their blowholes. They, um, they just die by, you know, they just suffocate to death. From these observation sessions, a spontaneous new game developed, first involving a ball inside Peter's mouth, which he, while he ran just the tips of his open jaws along her shins, she was no longer afraid that he would hurt her, and she found herself murmuring to him softly throughout, quote, I had no idea of the end result of this play, but this is obviously a sexy business. 
Her description of it is unmistakably a story of seduction, one Lovat can only convey by relying heavily on that well-worn tool of signifying ambiguity and anticipation, the ellipsis. Quote, I had many fears. Peter obviously realized them and found ways and props to reassure me. Peter continues pressing this game and slowly I gain confidence. I no longer demand that the ball be there in the beginning of the game to make me feel better. The mood is very gentle, still, hushed. All movements are slow. Tone is very quiet. Only slight murmurings from me. Peter is constantly, but ever so slowly, weaving his body around, eyes near closed." End of quote. She then speculates about his motivations. Perhaps this is his way of involving me in some form of sex play without scaring me away. But me thinks she doth protest too much. <laughs> Peter had no reason to think that Lovat was scared of sex play with him, given that she routinely relieved him of his erections. It seems more likely that this was Peter's way of involving her in a form of sex play in which she herself was actually interested. By her own admission, she was not scared when engaging in the other sex play with him, the one with a clear end result, but she also didn't find it sexy. The game with the ball in her knee, which she interpreted and experienced as some kind of sexual contact between them, was the one that fascinated her, just as it did him. It was real. Right? And the sexually mature Peter, however unlikely a suitor, knew the difference in exactly the same way that humans can tell when it's on. Initially, Lily presented Lovat as Peter's human mother, but the description became inappropriate when it became clear that the two subjects were behaving more like lovers than like a mother teaching her child to speak. Perhaps the best description of the relationship may be borrowed from Michel Foucault's interview from 1981, Friendship as a Way of Life, in which he discusses what he calls a homosexual way of life in some unconventional terms. Homosexuality, which here stands in for any resistant sexuality, has to do not with a specific set of practices, but with the need for invention or improvisation. Quote, how can a relational system be reached through sexual practices? It can yield intense relations not resembling those that are institutionalized." End of quote. Margaret and Peter's shared uncompromising willingness to find out yielded some intense relations, ones that can indeed be described as strange but true, or more precisely true because strange. Foucault encourages a sexual and cultural asasis, which amounts in the end to a sort of sexual quiet or perhaps a listening or a waiting, or listening as waiting. The interview ends with an imperative. Quote, we must think that what exists is far from filling all possible spaces to make unavoidable the question, what can be played? End of quote. The problem of the relational system was for Foucault a distinctly human one. For Lily, it could only be taken on between species or different types of intelligence. For Sagan and the Golden Record team, the problem of the relational system was not human, not multi-species, but cosmic. Or rather, the cosmos itself was the problem of the relational system, of the question what can be played. He traces his passion for the Voyager project, and perhaps even for astronomy itself, to a sound that comes from no animal, namely the harmony of the spheres found in the work of Johannes Kepler. He even included excerpts of electronica artist Laurie Spiegel's piece, Kepler's Harmony of, Worlds, of the Worlds on the Golden Record. In Harmonices Mundi, Kepler claimed that the speed of each planet corresponds to certain notes in the Latinate scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and that Earth's motion corresponds to the notes fa and mi, which, he argued, the Earth was forever humming. But these are not merely notes, they stand Straight, straightforwardly for the Latin word for famine. Sagan was transfixed by the idea that the hum of the earth is its famine. 
its love song cast upon the vastness of the deep. The earth itself as one massive message in a bottle, of which space probes launched by humans are merely tiny, modest, rinky-dink emissaries. The Golden Record presents the Earth not as a mother, but as a lover. It punctures the imaginary of the cosmos as the cold, silent reality of what is, with an other cosmos, that of speculation, of what could still happen that would change everything. And from Roland Barthes, we know that the lover, that most abject of beings, waits. Thank you.